relaxed, cool, just waiting for the world title. At the table, taking the last four balls, is a former champion on five occasions, Welshman Ray Redden. There you go. I've still got it. And there it goes. Throughout the 1970s, Ray Reardon dominated the world of snooker. He won the world championship six times. The game became hugely popular on television, and he was its biggest star. In fact, the fascination of this game to you, though. Oh, it's colourful. <coughs> it's artistic. You can should or, may, or try to make the white ball do what you want it to do. Oh, it's ambiguous. How do you mean ambiguous? Well, one day you can do everything, and another day you can do nothing. <laughs> you know, it's as frustrating as it is fascinating. Yes. The tough competitor with the twinkling eyes had been shaped by his early years in the South Wales Valleys, where he was born in 1932. Tredegar, where I was born, wow, what a lovely little place. It had a population of roughly about 15,000, I suppose, in those days, and nothing going back to 19, in the mid-40s, if you like. This is where it all happened, right behind me, number 57. Whitworth Terrace. My word, that's going back a few years. And as I look down here, I can see there's all sun patios and everything out here. I, they must be expecting some hot weather sometime in any case. But that's nice, because this is where it all happened. This is where I learned to play. I made my own little footballs out of pieces of paper and uh, marbles and the usual game that kids do, you know. And uh, Uncle Dan, who came to live with us later on, who was a master chess player, he was the one who actually got me going in the world of billiards and snooker, really. I got a small uh, three by two billiard table and we play with balls that wouldn't go in the pocket. And he said, well, you want smaller ones, like little marbles. Uh, and as a result, they went in the pocket. And if it works and you make them go in the pocket, it'll encourage you to play more. And all the other brothers took me up to the billiard hall. And it was absolutely magic, you know. Well, I'll tell you what, these steps didn't used to be there to start with. Makes it very hard these days coming up here. That was just a run down there. There was nothing. And it, all this, there's no road here. This was just mountain. And just up there, we used to be in the mountain. We used to dig holes in the mountain where we used to put seats in it, have a pipe coming out, cook some nice jacky potatoes, smoke paper, brown paper. Naughty, isn't it? I remember your face like if it were yesterday. Uh, but names, well, you know, I can't remember what happened yesterday well, sometimes. Well, you don't know, when you just left it. <laughs> <you know? laughs> there isn't at all. Well, no. they said you were going to come down to find people, and, and here you've turned up. Oh, That's wonderful. True. Isn't that fantastic? Yeah. Next door neighbour. 70 bloody years ago. And he wants me to remember his name. <laughs> I can't remember what happened yesterday. <laughs> sometimes I forget my own name. <laughs> See how Tredegar changed over the years and you into the 70s and 80s. It really, really changed, really. And as I'm look, walking up Castle Street here and I look down at the, the clock tower in the middle there, I mean, that used to be the bus station. All the bus stops, wherever, wherever you wanted to go, were parked around the clock. And there was pubs on the corner, everything evolved around there. It was a hive of activity. And I look down here today and I see boarded up here, closed there, nothing here, the buses are no more. And I thought, how sad this is, you know. What do people do these days? Ray Reardon is a highly intelligent person who still regrets not having enough education. But he passed up the chance to go to grammar school, following his father down the pit at 14 and free to pursue his passion for snooker. Of course, going down the mines, you just followed in your father's footsteps, really. You didn't know the dangers or the pitfalls, what were there. 
you didn't realize that what type of hard, hazardous life, risky life it was going to be because of the fact that you've fallen in your dad's footsteps. If it's safe for him, it's safe for me. And of course, I, I started off, as you say, 14 years ago, 1946, started in Tetris. And when you go down to the coal face there, you're assigned to a collier. You become the assistant, if you like, for want of a better word. I went with a guy, he was a scrat. In other words, he was mean. And he put me above all people with him. So the first week I worked my socks off, expecting to get a decent pocket money. And I, I would say a decent pocket money would be something like a pound, one pound 25p. You give me 50p. Very disappointed. So the following week, I'm down there, still has been assigned to him. I didn't work so hard that way. Eventually, I, I was there by myself. So I became a collier at an early age of 16. My money went up, and you know, suddenly I'm earning something like three pounds a week. But when you talk about three pounds a week, in, in, in sort of something like 1948, oh, to have my snooker, didn't it give me, I could play more games of snooker. It'd take a bit of pressure away, you know. Yeah. The young Reardon's game develops steadily in the snooker halls of Tredegar, especially the Workmen's Institute with its seven tables. Then, at the age of 16, he made it through to the Youth Championship of Great Britain and an all-Welsh final between Ray Reardon of Tredegar and Jack Carney of Ponta Dewey. We go to the Langham House, the BBC, sports report on a Saturday, introduced by Angus Mackay, Remember sports report? And here I am in Langham House. And we go up to, up to the top tower where he is, and you go into this huge room, and there's that enormous mic hanging down from the ceiling, with a, like that, like a Lord Haw Haw mic, where he used to broadcast over the wall and whatever. And there he is, and he's talking to the viewers, and he said, well, today we've got an all-world final of the Youth Championship of Great Britain, and in the final we've got Jack Carney of Ponte Dowie and Ray Raiden of Tredegar. Tredegar, he said, Epiphany, he said, that's the one, he said, that, that's where Nairon Bevan was born. He doesn't know where Nairon Bevan was born. Nairon Bevan was born in Tredegar. Epiphany was his constituency. So here I am, 16 years of age, from now on, I'm not going to trust any interviewer at all because they don't know anything. <laughs> I don't believe it. <laughs> are, there certain, are there certain shots that are full? No, those are very easy, actually, though. As you can see, first time. Like That's that. amazing. Are there any <laughs> shots that are, are foolproof in the sense that a fool like myself could do them? Oh, yes, sir. I could set you up a shot that you could go yourself. Oh, would you like to try that? I would certainly get a cue. Would you like to get a cue there? They set me up for that. <laughs> <laughs> These days, the hub of the game in Tredegar is the Mark Williams Snooker Club. Ray visits the club on a day when he's one of three world champions on view around the tables. There's the club's owner, of course, and the great Stephen Henry, who's practicing with Mark. And there's even another local hero on hand, an old friend of Ray's. It's Doug Mountjoy. No, I haven't seen Doug for years, and it's nice to see him back in the game again. And one of the reasons why he's come back in the game again is because of the condition that they have here at Mark's club. I remember coming here five, seven years ago, and I can assure you it was the pits. It was awful. It was disgusting. So the effort they put in to make this as it is now has been tremendous. It's been enormous. And you can see you've got young people in here of 8, 10, 12, 14 years of age. This is where the, the, the business of the game starts, you know. I mean, I learned to play at Tadiga Workman's Institute, which is not far from here, just up into the town. And when I was there, all my ambition was to become the champion of the club. And I'm sure these young aspiring players, that should be their aim, is to be the champion of the Mark Williams Club. Bear in mind that I had two shillings a week pocket money. And it, it was threepence again. So 
lose the pays. So you could have eight games of snooker for two shillings. But if you've lost them all, you're skinned for the week. So you better learn to play quick or take up something else. All your other fellow players, your mates as you call them, they on a say a Saturday night, they'd say to me, well, why are we gonna go up to the dance hall at Urban Jones in Tradiga here? But first we're gonna have a couple of pints. We're gonna meet at seven o'clock around the clock tower. And I would say, well, seven o'clock, which pub are you gonna use? Are you gonna use the, the Punch House, the Golden Lion, the Cambrian? And they would say, no, we're gonna go into the Punch House where they're gonna have a game of snooker and darts and, and have a few pints and a pool and one of it. And I said, well, I, I'll be there at nine o'clock because I will come here into the billiard hall and have two hours practice. And then I'd go and pick him up, have a game of darts, have a few pints and go up to the, 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 the dance hall, look for a girl as life itself. And, and so I missed out on nothing. Being a miner did have a lot of uh, influence on my snooker career. Merely the fact that you're playing with all these working class people, they were so supportive of you. And you didn't realize it until you went back down the pit the next day. And everybody would be asking him, how did he get on yesterday? Did he win, lose? No, I lost. But I'll get him next time. And that helped my attitude towards snooker to make me more competitive. Ray snooker was thriving but the pits of South Wales were going into serious decline. The young miner went to the Midlands to find work. He could make a living there, but the pit was still a dangerous place. Something seriously happened to me in the mines. And that changed my life altogether, really, because I got buried. And when you're buried in the mines, I mean, you, you're under about four or five tonne of rubble, and you can't move a muscle, and you doubled over and you can feel all your blood going out of your system. You, you can feel, you open your mouth to breathe and all the particles of dust goes into your mouth and you say, oh, I mustn't do that. I must breathe through my nose and, and my blood pressure was soaring and I had to concentrate on something. And I was lucky to have a brother who was 17 years younger than I, Brother Ron, and uh, I played marbles with him in my mind. Thousands of games of marbles. And eventually I got my blood pressure right down. I, I nearly stopped my heart, but I just got it right down low. And, and I survived. So I said, I don't think I'm worried about a game of snooker. There's other things in life, you know. It's not the end of the world, is a game of snooker, but it's so essential to those who play it. Well, it's been a pleasure. Absolutely a pleasure. We've seen Doug over there, he's all right. We've had a work with him. Full of legends in here today. After being buried alive in the pits, Ray Reardon left coal mining in the late 1950s. Education and experience hadn't prepared him for any other career, but he hit on the idea of the police force. The training regime came as a bit of a shock. It's unbelievable. There was a, the guy in charge of, of the, uh, the keep fit. I mean, don't forget, I've been down the mines for, for 11 years, and I'm, I'm not going to be fit, can't I, you know, in those conditions. Anyhow, I'm, I'm at the college, and they're going out on a Wednesday. They went on a three-mile run. For the first 150 yards, I'm all right. Then after that, I walk. So I'm going to walk three miles. So it's going to take me about an hour and a quarter, hour and a half. So when I go back, he's still there. And I go through the gate, go click. And he said, PC Red, and he said, you're not going to become a policeman. Hmm. And I looked at Sergeant Blyle, I said, Sergeant Blyle, I'm going to become a policeman. And he said, how do you make that out? Well, I said, when I'm out on the beat and I get a call to go down to a trouble at a pub somewhere, I'll walk down. And by the time I get there, they live it all the hell out of each other. And I'll just pick him up and take him up. He said, I think you may become a policeman. And of course, I continued to my snooker. And in fact, I achieved my ambition of winning the English Amateur Championship in 1963-64, whilst I was in the police force. And then later on, some good luck came to me to go on a tour of South Africa. And as a result of that, of course, I eventually turned professional. You know. And then along came colour television. Pot Black was a sudden death competition, which transformed the fortunes of snooker. But taking part was a risky venture for Ray, who had a long-term professional. What if I take part in Port Black? It's a one-frame knockout, sudden death. And you lose in the first round. So you don't put many balls. And you're trying to sell yourself by advertising, sending circles out the club to secondaries. And they see this Port Black and you've gone out first round and you haven't scored anything. And they say, well, we don't even in our club. 
that's very dodgy, that's very risky. So I took the risk. And I was one of the lucky ones because I won the first one in 1969. And that helped to change my career. The 1970s saw the World Championship become a big TV event. The long, intense battles of these snooker finals were perfect for Reardon. He was a great potter, but he also had the gritty determination and the tactical skill you needed to win. But above all, Ray Reardon was an entertainer. In the 70s and 80s, the snooker calendar wasn't jammed with tournaments. So Ray spent the summers on the holiday camp circuit, entertaining the crowds with his repertoire of trick shots and an invitation to all comers to have a go with a world champion. Snooker has transformed itself since those early days of celebrity in the 70s. It's fast, dynamic, and full of appeal to young and old alike. It certainly appeals to Ray Reardon, who relishes the new style of the game. <laughs> Coming to the Welsh Open, well, I love that. And especially in Newport. Thank you very much. Very well. Thank you. It's great to Thank see the passion for the game still strong in Wales. Thank you. I like just slipping into the auditorium when it's empty, before the crowds come. It's great to get a feeling for the space. It's like theatre, really. And for a long time, it was my stage, and I loved every moment. At the moment, I'm just absorbing what, what is here, what I can use for myself when I'm playing. I mean, where we are now, we've got an empty arena, and you can imagine it full, you know. And you, you can imagine goose pimples coming on your, on your face and up your back of your arm, you know. And I look around, and I think, wow, this is going to be something today. And then I want to just get the general feeling of how far I'm away from the audience. I don't like to be too far. If possible, I like to communicate to them in some way, shape, or form. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> this it tells me which pocket to play was more friendly than the other one. <laughs> just by general looking at it, feeling it, it's, 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 a, it's, it's a world of experience which tells you that, that I'd be better potting them up there than in here, and I'd be better potting them in there than in here. It, it favours you fractionally, marginally. I'm talking, oh, 128th of an inch or something, you know, something infinitesimal, really. I now look where the cameras are. I know there'll be three of them, there'll be one over there, coming down the table, elongated sort of thing. And you'll have two coming down to the, uh, down the, as far as the middle pocket, I suppose. That's generally, that's very general. And I want to know where they are for my purpose, not for their purpose. Here is a media which I'm going to exploit. I'm going to sell myself to the public just by doing various things, whether I, I twaddle my ear or pinch my nose or Go, go in your pocket for a bit of chalk or something, or adjust your tie. I, I'm doing it to attract attention, that they will focus on me rather than him. I mean, this is free. Sell yourself. I mean, you've got to pay a lot of money to get on television. I can do it for nothing. You're aware of it, you know, yeah. You make sure that when you, the, the cameras will find, because when you get up, they're not expecting you to get up. Get on him. Where's he going? What's he doing? Where's he, what's he doing over there? And then suddenly they become aware of this, this person in distress. Wow. Bit of mileage in you, isn't it? And you, you just got to exploit it, I'm afraid. <laughs> Sometimes you may have heard, or people may have heard, uh, one of the commentators said, oh, my God, he's gone into the zone by the look of him. In other words, he, he's not aware of anything that's going on around him. When he's playing in this sort of form, Seven. you can't afford to let him in with red spread all over the table like this. He's right in with, like if the balls are his, and he's nurturing them and 
I'm going to take you home, come with me and do this. And they do exactly as he says. It's wonderful. And it isn't very often you go into that zone, but when you get in there, oh, I can't explain it. It's, you never miss anything. Your position of play is accurate. It's spot on within inches of where you want it to go. Nothing's difficult. And you're playing so well that even if you did make a bit of a loose shot, you're playing so well that you can recover from it because you're on form, as they say. You're looking well. Amazing, oh God, isn't it? Bloody hell. <laughs> How old are you now? Well, I shouldn't say that's a bit rude, really. But... Well, I'll be 18 October. Let's put it that way. Yeah, you don't look a day over 60, look. He's a smile, he's flattering. Do you still get the buzz when you when you walk out and you sort of see the, the arena glistening, ready oh, to yeah, go? Yes, well, you're bound to answer, really. It's always changing, but it's changing for the good, you know. I've only put one tweet out today, yeah. and, oh, there, there, and there, look, there, there it is. How's that? <laughs> And I've got a plug there as well. That's the only tweet and I've got. I've got a plug on the, on the Facebook yet. What do you think I of that? Boss. Well, surely you'd say the word legend is grossly overused in sport, but for a man of that stature and character and personality and warmth, <laughs> legend's the right word, isn't it? The... That table was so fast. It was, wasn't it? Yeah. Remember? Lightning. Lightning. Mm. You just rolled up to it and you just opened it and it kept rolling. Mm. And you've only got this limited time. Yeah. I think the thing is what Ray developed first, more than any other player, he dominated the table. When he was, even if he wasn't, you know, actually on the table playing, he'd kind of have an aura, walk around the table, laughing in the crowd. So all of a sudden, you're almost frightened of, to play against him sometimes. You know, you thought, oh, this is Ray Reardon at the table. I'll wait till he gets away from the table before I come to the table. He had that wonderful aura about him. Give you a steely look sometimes if, if you thought you'd played a foul and you didn't admit it or something like that. He'd give you the eyeball. So everything was precise with Ray. Every, everything had to be done right. On the last two balls, then. The little false smile sometimes. I knew it wasn't always the, the happy go lucky jovial chappy that he, he portrayed sometimes because he was a. Well, he had. Uh, I'm just trying to think of the right word. He was just a gritty, determined character. That was the thing about Ray. Yes. Do you remember when I played you in Pontins? So I was English oh, amateur yeah, champion, oh, yeah. and the amateurs <laughs> qualified, as you know, yes. and played against the pros. And then, you got start, you got start. Yeah. Twenty-five. Anyway, the draw came out, and what have yeah. drawn? The Ray Reardon, the perfect, world, the perfect, world perfect. champion. Perfect. Anyway, I was absolutely Ideal thrilled. Just honestly. what you need. You know. yeah. The good news was we were playing next morning at half past ten. <laughs> Which, as you know, you had a reputation of not being very good in the morning. Yeah, I like him thinking that. That's so good. I can, get, I can get it up, right? I'm like thinking that. 25 starts. <laughs> yeah. I, like I, like I like that. Anyway, I won one frame on the black when I cleared up. <laughs> I got up at 25 start. I did. To be honest, though, I did not see you. Right. Yeah. You give me a lesson, right? And I understood that. But you need that. Yes, but but what we you told me that, yeah. afterwards always stayed with me. I said you played really well there, Ray. And the words you said to me was, played well. I had to play well be, to play to beat you, giving you 25 start. Right. Well, I felt 10 foot high. Yeah. Honestly, I've gone from being well, on the gone, floor you think of to it, like that. Yeah. It was a very nice thing for you to say, because you had, oh, I learned from it. I obviously right. learned from what you'd done to me, because oh, yeah. you stopped me but playing. But it's so you know? important, isn't it, really? I think um, six times champion of the world is a wonderful achievement. And, and what I see about great champions is, they always seem to find something at the right time in the match. Yeah, it doesn't have right. to be the last no, frame, no, but no. you find something when you need it the most. Yeah. It's, not, it's not at the end of a frame, always, or the end of a match. It's when they really need it, when they're struggling a little bit, or they can see their opponent starting to play well, they find something, and that's why they're champions. But you, sometimes it doesn't go as you'd like it to go. And somewhere along the way, you, you've got to find a way to learn to win when you're slightly off form. You Would know, you like to play against these players today? You would have loved it, wouldn't you? I'd love it. <laughs> I'd absolutely love it. But I don't know how I'd cope with them, actually, because yeah. I was only looking at it the other day, and I was looking at the speeds of the table, how the balls open up when you go into them, yes. and they just spread. They didn't spread in our days. No. So the tables are friendly. Everything is straight. Mm. There's no nap on the table like in no, our days. No, that's day. right, yeah. Mm. They can back their ability of hitting the ball straight. So you've got to be a good cueist, mm. have a good nerve, and back your ability, and you can pot it, because yes. the white's going to go straight. Dead straight. But having said that, so it makes potting a little bit easier, if you like, but it also makes it far more difficult to defend. Yes.
Ray Reardon stayed at the top of the game right into the mid-1980s. But in 1991, he retired, and I spent the last two decades on the balmy shores of Tor Bay, where he enjoys his life to the full. People have often asked me, why did I go to Tor Bay, the English Riviera? Well, I never knew it was the English Riviera until I got down here, and that was a, as a result of my holiday camp playing. I'm the president of Cheston Golf Club. That's one of the reasons why I came down here in the first place. Which is a really friendly place that caters for players of all ages. <laughs> Are you all right? Excellent, good luck. Good I often play around the golf with the manager. Great shot. Simon Borden. Great shot. And of course, I play loads of golf with the members. <laughs> Nobody more surprised. I'm not bad, I'm playing off 13 at the moment. Which is, for me at my age is not a bad, not a bad handicap, quite good really. I don't hit it far enough. There's people up there who can throw it further than I can hit it. What a junior side we've got here. We've got a hundred juniors now. A hundred now. hundred now, which, which twelve are young well, girls. I mentioned earlier on in eighty odd, it's a hundred now. It's a hundred, but, 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 but twelve of them are young girls. And young girls. And, I mean, some of them, the bag's bigger than the... the, the <laughs> I mean, they're this height. Absolutely. They're just seven, eight years of age. Sure. The thing is, the, the, the club's got to, got to be very accessible, isn't oh, it? Oh, yeah. and it's got to live in modern times now. Absolutely. Yeah. Oh, gosh, yeah. Yeah. oh, yes. Oh, that's a cracker. Oh, do you mean? That's a beautiful shot. I came on the practice skin the other day on the, on the putting range, and I saw one of our lads. I said, hi, oh, young man. I said, I haven't seen you for a while. How are you keeping? I said, you look well. Oh, he said, I'm all right. He said, but I said, how's your game? Oh, he said, uh, it's awful at the moment. Said, I, I can't play at the moment. Said, I've got a new job and I haven't got time to practice. I haven't got time to practice? You find time. Yeah, yeah, of you course you do. You make your own time. Yeah. That's, what, that's the passion, that's the yeah. love, the affection yeah. or something. Of course, it's well, not going to come to you. I mean, how, how often did you practice, Ray? Well, you, you, you can never get me off the table. Yeah. Okay then, Ray, two putts. Well, that's not bad. Oh, it's, uh, go on then, I'll get in. <laughs> Well done, Ray. Well done. How about that? that Excellent. Excellent. Thank you very much, Thank Mr. You. President. Very Thank kind. You. Cheers. Thank you, Simon. Thank, Thank you. you. Yes, well, it's been a bit of a journey, hasn't it, really? Absolutely magic, you know, from Tredegar, which was Terrace. Been around the world 12 times. Met some wonderful people, fated everywhere. Couldn't have wished for better, actually. It's been, I've been such a lucky chap, it's unbelievable. And, and here we are now, I'm down in Devon, retired here, and it's absolutely glorious. Somebody once said snooker was a sign of a misspent youth. Well, all I can say to those people, uh, I wish I'd started earlier. It's been a great trip. I loved every moment. I'd love to do it again.